So um, hello, everybody. Welcome to this um, BAA Wednesday evening webinar. Um, we're still going after, uh, after more than a year in uh, various forms of lockdown. And uh, I think the webinars are still managing to uh, keep people interested, lo lots of interesting subjects. And uh, we've got webinars planned now right through to the end of the summer. And hopefully we'll keep them going even once uh, physical meetings restart. So um, tonight we have somebody who probably doesn't need much introduction to BAA members, Dr. Nick Hewitt, um, former director of the Deep Sky section and, um, and general kind of Deep Sky uh, expert extraordinaire. Also, um, also a, great, uh, a great authority on cricket and rugby matters, particularly <laughs> rugby referring to Northamptonshire. Um, so um, tonight you'll be pleased to hear that Nick's not going to be talking about cricket or rugby. He's going to be covering because <laughs> I know that would annoy certain people. He's, he's going to be covering the Great Debate. And uh, the Great Debate, is, as Nick will say, um, really was one of the big, big questions in astronomy in the early 20th century about whether the galaxies that we see in the sky uh, are external, far away things or, or not so far away. And it's difficult now to kind of, for us to project ourselves back to then, I think, and, and kind of with what we know now to kind of think back to then when that, that subject hadn't been resolved. Um, so as, as these webinars normally go, Nick will talk for about 45 minutes. We'll take questions. Um, if you're watching on Zoom, uh, just post your question there and I'll feed them to Nick afterwards. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, you can put something in the YouTube chat and I'll pick up stuff from there as well. So um, hopefully we'll have plenty of questions. And if we don't, I'll make some up to make sure that we, <laughs> we keep you on your toes. So Nick, over to you. Okay, let's share this screen. Oh, all that gone. Share. I'll mute my camera as well. And my video, since having swallowed a fly, I might go into a cough <laughs> spasm. Okay, does that come up okay? Yeah, that's that's good. Okay. Okay. Um, you, yeah, that's better now. That's full screen. Great. Let's just uh, get rid of that. Right. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm uh, delighted to be doing this webinar. It's uh, been a bit delayed um, because, of course, the COVID pandemics had a lot of victims, and probably the least significant of these. Uh, has been the postponement of this talk, which uh, I was hoping to give at the centenary of the meeting that would become known as the Great Debate, but we're nearly a year on, um, so it goes. A hundred years ago, the exact nature of the place in the universe of these glorious spiral galaxies like Messier 101 um, were, were, were very unclear. Um, the equally uh, unclear was the nature of the slightly more dull um, elliptical nebulae, as they were known as then. But on the 26th of April 1920, there was a meeting at the National Academy of Sciences in Washington, DC. And um, this, in some ways, uh, rather routine meeting did, in fact, uh, provoked some controversy. It was called the scale of the universe. The meeting was on the scale of the universe and uh, became a clash of two of the great astronomers of the earlier part of the 20th century. They had very different personalities and different opinions. Um, and they would, uh, this would prove a watershed and I, I think in our understanding uh, of the universe. A little bit of uh, background context, of course, the world in 1920, we just recovered from the, this dreadful Great War, the First World War, uh, where 8.5 million people had died in conflict, and of course, very many more um, civilians suffered too. Um, so it, it was just 18 months or so after the end of that war. Um, that led to the League of Nations being founded. It's interesting that uh, both um, the USSR, as, as it was, the Russia in those days, and America did not take part in that. Um, whether you think the League of Nations has been an effective body, uh, turning it, of course, into, uh, um, into United Nations uh, is a matter for a further debate. Um, and then, of course, scarily, the 1919, we had the Spanish flu, which worldwide 
killed a very estimated 50 million people. So 1919, 1920 was a pretty tough time. Um, and uh, in Eastern Europe, it was arguably even worse. The uh, Russian Civil War uh, followed on from the revolution and uh, famine and war killed some 8 million uh, Russians at that time. And uh, it wasn't long before the communists took over the control of the USSR, which was founded a couple of years later. Equally damaging, really, in America, they began prohibition. Um, this would have been a, a tragedy for amateur astronomers, of course. Um, we would have been out there protesting. We want beer. Uh, we do like our beer after meals, meetings, and hopefully uh, when the meetings get back to face to face, we'll be adjourning to the pub afterwards. So the world was quite a, a difficult place. Um, astronomy, however, was going from strength to strength. The, uh, the two decades up to 1920 um, was, you could argue, the birth of astrophysics as we now know it, because spectroscopy and photography had become really uh, much more uh, effective tools and indeed vital tools. And they, uh, the, the, they really started the progress of making inroads into the nature of the universe that uh, we now take for granted in some ways. And this is only some 200 years, 100 years ago or so. The sources of stellar energy were, were not entirely clear. Uh, we had um, this side of uh, the Atlantic, Arthur Eddington and Sir James Jeans were, were working on this very effectively, uh, but it wasn't in 1920 entirely clear what the cause of uh, the solar energy was, or indeed that of the stars. Um, the idea of stellar evolution were very much in the early days. In fact, they sort of got it back to front, really. The red giants were the, were the early stars and, uh, uh, and other stars, the lesser stars, if you like, um, were, were less ma more mature stars. Uh, and that was really being, uh, being worked on too. The universe generally was thought to be um, that based on the work of Jacobus Capitain, the, the Dutch astronomer. Um, he worked with uh, stellar motions and stellar counts and uh, argued for a sun-centered galaxy, which was thought to be a lenticular-like galaxy, a lens-shaped galaxy. Um, and he had estimated it to be about 30,000 light years across by 6,000 uh, light years wide. So, you know, some people would call it Captain's universe, and uh, he was very respected, and that was um, a pretty firm in stone at that time. <clears throat> across the pond, the Americans uh, were very much getting going, uh, partly with the help of a, a, a large team of astronomers at Harvard, which was one of the premier uh, observatories in, in, in the world at that time. Um, many of these very, uh, uh, very clever ladies were, were working on variety of astronomy. They were known as the computers, but they did an awful lot more. They, they were looking at variable stars, they were looking at spectra. And indeed, um, through the work of, uh, of, of these ladies, largely, um, the Henry Draper catalogue of spectral types was published. Uh, the first of three volumes uh, came out um, around the time of the Great Debate. Henry Draper himself was a, a medical man um, and had died relatively young, but he'd married a, a wealthy lady who, who, who actually uh, funded the publication of the catalogue that bears his name. He was in fact just an amateur astronomer, uh, although a, a very skilled um, uh, amateur astronomer. So these spectral types paved the way for an awful lot of astrophysics. Now, at the back there, you'll see a, a walrus-like chap. Um, this was Edward Pickering. Um, now, Pickering was uh, an extremely skilled um, director of the Harvard Observatory, and uh, he, he has a small part to pay in this. Um, at the same time, 1919, the International Astronomical Union was formed, um, so an awful lot of decisions were uh, were made from there afterwards, including the demotion of Pluto later, of course, uh, to become a dwarf planet. Um, where Edward Pickering comes into this is that he died. Um, he died in 1919, 
And um, at the time of the debate, the, uh, the vacancy as director of Harvard College Observatory uh, was vacant. Um, and that has a bearing on what I'm going to say later. Another very important thing that was happening around this time was the rise of the observatories in the Western USA. And they decided that some of the, uh, uh, the East Coast observatories and observatories in Europe were, were no longer fit for purpose. And they started popping some really impressive um, instrumentation on what was then very remote sites. Um, Mount Wilson in, uh, in, in over the now overlooks Los Angeles, but Los Angeles was not a particularly large place back in uh, uh, back in the early part of the 20th century, but it soon gained um, two of the best instruments in the world, two of the great uh, telescopes um, of the world, the 60 inch and the 100 inch Hooker telescope. Around about the same time, um, well, a little bit earlier, um, on Mount Hamilton, the Lick telescope, the great refractor, 60, 36 inch refracting telescope was, uh, was commissioned in the late 1880s. Um, and the Crossley reflector uh, was moved from the UK uh, to Mount Hamilton, um, and uh, that would become an important instrument in this talk too. At Mount Wilson, we, we had one of our two protagonists um, for this great debate, Harlow Shapley. Um, he was there from 1914 to 1921. Um, and when he was there, he was, uh, he, he was studying globular clusters in the main and it published 40 important papers on, on, this, uh, on these in fact, rather fantastic clusters. Um, at Lick, we had Heber Curtis. Heber Curtis was, uh, um, had been there a little longer. Um, he started in 1902 and um, he, he'd been in doing important work uh, looking at planetary nebulae um, and also looking at the spiral nebulae, doing both of these initially visually, and then uh, as photography uh, got better and better, he started studying with uh, photography. <clears throat> Around this time, there were three very important uh, developments in astronomy. Um, one was the, uh, the period luminosity relationship of the Seafield variables. Um, this was a uh, discovery of Henrietta Swan Leavitt, um, and she published her, uh, her, her findings in 1912. Come back to that in two secs. Um, the development of the Hertzsprung Russell diagram in uh, 1910 uh, to 1913. Um, this was a, uh, um, they, they were separate in their, uh, in their conclusions, but they, uh, they've got the names together with this uh, diagram. Um, Aina Hutsprung in uh, a Danish astronomer and Henry Norris Russell at uh, Princeton. And these, uh, these chaps developed the HR diagram as we'll call it from now on. And then over in Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff in Arizona, uh, Vesto Slifer um, found that he was developing his technique with spectroscopy and turning it on the nebulae as they were then and discovered the uh, redshift in the galaxies or many of most of the galaxies. So the first and foremost, um, the CFID variables. Um, this was uh, Leavitt's law that the classical CFIDs, the longer pulsation um, of, of one of these stars, the more luminous the star. And knowing the luminosity of the star, the distance could be determined. She um, was sent pla um, photographic plates that had been taken in Arequipa in Peru. Um, which was a, a, an observatory in South America that Harvard um, ran. Um, I was, I was thoughts, the travel of some of these photographic plates from Peru uh, to, to North Eastern United States, I think, you know, it's quite a passage. These days we just flash things down uh, on an email. Um, but uh, the, these obviously traveled by, uh, by ship and train and what have you. But she was um, looking for variable stars in the Magellanic clouds, the large and small Magellanic clouds. This is the small Magellanic cloud taken uh, with an eye telescope um, a few years back by myself with uh, 47 Tucani nearby. Um, the, uh, what she actually found in these two 
galaxies, as we now call them, or nebulae, um, was 1,477 variable stars, of which several were CFIDs. And they, she clearly demonstrated that the, uh, they had, she could measure the pulsation of these. And uh, on the basis of that, we could start working out the distance. Because if we take the Magellanic clouds as being all the components within each of these galaxies as being approximately the same distance from us, um, you could actually uh, compare some of the different CFIDs and work out the distance to these galaxies to an extent. The HR diagram um, is still a very important tool. It, it basically plots the relationship between the star's absolute magnitudes, which is their luminosity, and their stellar classification by spectral type or, or their temperature. I'm going to shove myself a little bit further up. Don't see me. Um, and the, this became a, a, a very important tool in, in developing the evolution of stars and, uh, and indeed distance measures. Um, families of stars, in particularly in open star clusters and globular star clusters, could be uh, studied in some depth uh, by looking at uh, their, the spectra and the magnitudes and turning these into what's called a color magnitude diagram. And um, all the components, again, in these clusters um, were more or less the same distance. So uh, th this became a, a very important tool. One of the most important reasons was because true stellar parallax were actually measuring uh, the displacement of a, of a star against the stellar background. Um, using the Earth's orbit uh, as a baseline, uh, couldn't really take you out further than 300 light years back in 1920. Um, but by using indirect methods, uh, particularly what are called parallax methods, but they're not true parallax methods, um, you could work out the distance modulus, which is by this equation, where little m is the observed magnitude large M is the absolute magnitude and uh, D is the distance. Um, you would use both what we call photo photometric and spectroscopic parallax methods, where you looked at the main sequences of globular and, and open star clusters. And uh, by measuring, uh, sorry, by matching it to the main sequence of a, a more established cluster where a distance was known, you could estimate the distance to those clusters too. And that, of course, became very important in the study of globular star clusters with regards to this, uh, this talk. Besto Slipher um, basically tweaked the spectrograph to make it a, a faster instrument so he could look at much fainter objects than, uh, than the solar system objects where he'd started. I'd like to point out that this, um, this image was taken by a picture of the, uh, the 24 inch at Flagstaff. Um, uh, it does not have a kink in it. That was not his adaption. Um, that is just my incompetence as a, getting a wide field view of a very long telescope. But uh, Slipher turned it on the Andromeda Nebula first, um, and uh, he found that its spectrum was very like the stars of the Milky Way galaxy. It was not particularly gaseous. But he also noticed that it had a, a slight blue shift, and uh, he put up some, uh, some figures here. Um, you might be able to see the, the top two are, uh, are Messier 31 itself and uh, Messier 32. Uh, the little uh, dwarf elliptical that, uh, companion of the Andromeda galaxy. And they were uh, showing suggestion that they were coming towards us. But the vast majority of other galaxies that he, uh, he looked at, the um, possible island universes showed uh, significant redshifts. And the further he went out, the fainter he looked at, the often the, the redshift was quite significant. Now, these aren't slifers, uh, spectras, spectri, but spectra, but uh, the, the, they're basically taken a bit later, but they do show this shift of the calcium lines further down towards the red end of the spectrum. And of course, this was uh, a remarkable finding um, in 1912. So we, we had these um, 
important tools, uh, but we also had some fairly conflicting theories of uh, how the universe was structured. Now, the first of these was the big galaxy theory. This was very much Shapley's baby. Um, he thought the Milky Way was the universe. He had measured the distances and positions to the globular star clusters um, over the previous four years, four, four to five years, um, and thought the Milky Way was uh, around 300,000 light years uh, in diameter, contrasting this with the Captain 30,000 light years. So quite, quite a, a mark difference in uh, estimates. He also stated on the basis of this that the sun was not the center of the galaxy. The globular star clusters were significantly skewed away from the sun. Uh, and so he, he thought that our uh, helios, you know, heliocentric uh, position in the galaxy was not likely to be the case. Um, he felt the spiral nebulae were likely to be within the Milky Way galaxy because he assumed that everything was in such a large galaxy. Um, a minority of astronomers, in fact, were still thinking in terms of um, the uh, spiral nebulae as being early solar systems forming, uh, part of stellar evolution, the very early birth of stars. Um, and that's reasonable on the basis of what was seen uh, with the um, visual observers in the late 19th century. Um, there was certainly a lot of spiral structure and they thought that the condensation in the middle was going to turn into a star and the spiral arms would later become uh, uh, sort of planets. Um, and th this was a, a minority view by 1920, but there were still some people clinging on to it. Uh, and certainly Shapley thought this might be the case. <clears throat> One thing uh, that occurred in the uh, late 19th century was a nova uh, was seen to go off in the Andromeda galaxy. This was later called S. Andromedae um, and uh, was, was fairly widely observed. And um, it had a, a de it declined in a way that a nova might, um, although probably over a longer period of time. Um, but if it had been um, a nova, um, then if it was outside the Milky Way galaxy, it would be uh, producing impossible amounts of energy. So th this was thought to be unlikely by the Big Bang, uh, uh, sorry, the big galaxy theorists. Um, supernovae, of course, were not yet a recognized uh, concept. It took um, Ritzwicki in 1931 to really develop the term uh, uh, supernova. Uh, of course, S Andromeda was indeed a, a supernova um, and uh, this became clear later. Um, the big uh, redshift seen in the spectra of some of these spiral nebulae um, was indeed a, a, a bit of a problem for the big galaxy theories. A, a variety of thoughts were that the nebulae were being sort of puffed off, um, the spiral nebulae were being pushed off by some uncertain force, possibly radiation and some other unusual stellar wind type of uh, They were not very satisfactory, the theories of, um, uh, of redshift with regards to the big galaxy theory. The alternative theory, broadly speaking, uh, was the island universe theory, where the Milky Way galaxy was captain's uh, size, 30,000 uh, light years across, um, with the sun at the center. Um, it would be fair to say that the vast majority uh, of astronomers thought the um, Milky Way galaxy uh, and the spiral nebulae were likely to be very similar entities. Um, and in fact, the spiral nebulae would be uh, outside the Milky Way galaxy. It was probably the main view. But um, Harlow Shapley did put a spoke in that particular wheel. And, uh, um, and Adrian van Marmen, who I'll mention a, a little bit later, um, also um, really rather put the doubts in the, in the minds of the island universe people. Another fairly convincing thing was that from 1909, um, Novi were discovered in Messier 31. Um, we, we're fairly familiar with these Novi now. I know that uh, 
uh, George Carey and, and Nick James um, are observ observers and, and indeed uh, discoverers of, uh, of Novi in Messier 31. And they'll sort of peak around magnitude 15 or magnitude 16. Now, if, if the Messier 31 was within the Milky Way galaxy and Novi, much fainter things that seem to be just like Novi, um, why are they just seen in one small section of the Milky Way galaxy? They, they, this was another uh, good reason to suspect that, um, that the, the spiral nebulae were beyond the Milky Way. Um, one thing that would be a big problem for the island universe theory was if stellar motion could be measured in the uh, in spiral nebulae. That is, if you could pick out stars and detect their individual motion and they were seen to be rotating. Um, and this was something that Van Manen and uh, Shapley believed. Um, the stars would be traveling at such a significant fraction of the speed of light. If they were beyond the Milky Way, that would be almost impossible. So how did this great debate actually come about? We've seen several theories, but um, how did this come about? Well, it really was a suggestion from one of the great uh, uh, American astronomers, George Ellery Hale. Um, Hale was an important guy. He, he, he developed an enormous amount of stuff in, in America. Um, his father, William Ellery Hale, had been uh, in the right place at the right time. In, 1871, Chicago essentially burned down, um, 300 deaths and uh, a huge number of homeless. And um, Hale Senior uh, stepped in to uh, help rebuilding and particularly with regards elevators in what became the sort of skyscrapers or early skyscrapers. He would uh, put in the lifts into the new builds and um, eventually sold out for the uh, for his company to be taken over by Otis, still a very well-known um, lift company now. Through this, he became very wealthy, but he also endowed um, uh, a considerable amount of money to um, a lecture at the National Academy of uh, Sciences. And uh, they had an annual meeting, and the one in April of 1920 was being uh, discussed between George Ellery Hale, son of William, and uh, Charles Abbott, who was the Assistant Secretary of the Smithsonian. Um, now, Hale had uh, developed important observatories. He developed Mount Wilson and um, let, would later develop uh, the 200 inch at Mount Palomar, um, and uh, a bit of help from Andrew Carnegie, and also the Hooker 100 inch telescope. 40 inch refractor at Yerkes and so forth. So he, he's a very, very important uh, man triggering uh, some of the great discoveries and great instruments in American astro astronomy. Now these two got together and they wanted to have the, uh, the lecture in memory of uh, William Ellery Hale. And they, they were discussing two possible topics. One was relativity, hot topic at the time. Einstein's papers had come out 15 and five years uh, beforehand. Um, it was absolutely filling all the mags and everything in Europe. It was, uh, it was a hot topic. And, and of course, uh, in 1919, um, Eddington had gone off to the uh, island of, of uh, Africa, Principe, and uh, observed solar eclipse, proving Einstein was correct. That the sun could bend light. The sun in this picture in Taurus, um, was shown to actually uh, slightly displace the, the pr predicted position of the stars. So relativity was, um, was hot topic. Um, the other possibility was the nature of the island universes. But uh, Hale really wanted to do relativity, but Abbott didn't. And I love this quote. As to relativity, I must confess that I would rather have a subject in which there would be half a dozen members of the academy competent enough to understand at least a few words of what the speakers were trying to say if we had a symposium on it. I pray to God that the progress of science will send relativity to some region of space beyond the fourth dimension from whence it may never return to plague us. And he was obviously fairly persuasive with that because uh, the island universe was going to be. Um, but it was eventually broadened to the scale of the universe. 
So the next question really would be who would present these the, the, the papers at this meeting? Quick slot. Well, Hale suggested two speakers. The first he thought of was uh, Professor Campbell uh, at Lick Observatory, a uh, very respected, uh, important astronomer. Um, and against, if you want, against Harlow Shapley uh, from his own observatory at Mount Wilson. But Campbell, um, although pleased to be asked, thought that Peter Curtis was uh, a more appropriate chap to do this because um, he'd been working for uh, nearly two decades on the spiral nebulae and um, he'd been not only studying them but he'd been talking on them so he was uh, pretty in touch with his subject. Um, Curtis was a fairly quiet sort of chap really I think probably somewhat reserved. Um, he was a bit reluctant initially but uh, then he saw it as a possible scrap and um, got more enthusiastic. Now, Shapley was um, very keen to take over from Edward Pickering at, uh, as director of Harvard Observatory. Um, and uh, he thought that going over to the East Coast, uh, east, east side of America and, uh, and giving a talk in a debate might, uh, might screw his chances of this. Um, but because um, uh, Hale was, was his boss, he, he, he really felt he ought to do it. <clears throat> so in um, basically, Shapley and Curtis agreed to do this. And in um, February uh, of 1920, uh, Abbott cabled Hale saying that they'd agreed. And uh, he suggested 45 minutes each on the scale of the universe. Um, this would be truncated later, most unfortunately, I think. So there's the uh, Shapley was going to talk on the size of the galaxy and Curtis would counter with the talk on island universes. And this is a, a copy of the, the telegram um, from Hale uh, to, to Shapley. They're going to get a reasonable stipend, $150, uh, which is quite a lot of money back in 1920. Um, for his expenses and of course it's a long trip from uh, down the southwest to the northeast of the states. So a little bit about the two protagonists. Let me do it. Yeah, not too bad. Um, I think we could safely say he, he was a, an ambitious and somewhat pugnacious chap, probably a bit Marmite. He had an interesting career. Neither of these two astronomers um, had a, an initial background in astronomy, both unusual career. He uh, dropped out of school and became a crime reporter at the age 15. I don't know if that would happen these days, probably not. But it does give him a sort of Edward G. Robinson feel, if uh, any of you are old enough to remember Edward G. Robinson, of course. Um, but he was a very bright chap and completed a six year course in 18 months when he went back to school and, uh, uh, and then went to the University of Missouri. Now, this is a, a thoughtful talk tale that he, he wasn't sure what he was going to study, so he couldn't pronounce archaeology, so he went to uh, astronomy next and uh, made a great success of it, of course. At the time of the debate, he was 35. Um, he graduated uh, he, uh, and went to Princeton and um, fell into a good company because he uh, started working on variable stars with uh, Henry Norris Russell. Um, and uh, he, he was important in so much as he showed CFIDs were pulsations, not eclipsing binaries, as poss possibly been thought beforehand, and um, worked um, up the paper on the nature and course causes of, vari of CFID variation um, in conjunction, of course, with Leavitt's work. So he was obviously well enough thought of to be appointed as junior astronomer at um, Wilson in 1914. Um, I rather like this too. He, 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 it was obviously a big year for Shapley. He, he uh, married a fellow student from Princeton, Martha Betts. She, she was well known as being a very, very clever astronomer, um, and, and, but particularly mathematician. Um, and immediately after they got married, their, their honeymoon was to go to Mount Wilson. And uh, uh, <laughs> I do like this. It was a long trip, but I had some nice observations with me. And we worked on the orbits of eclipsing binaries on the honeymoon. 
Mrs. Shapley was very quick at computing, so we enjoyed ourselves for a couple of days. But I suppose a train would perhaps not be the best place to um, do what most people do on the honeymoon. Um, but, you know, good for him. Made the best of a long journey, about two or three days, I think. So he then got let loose on the 60 inch reflector at Mount Wilson, which was uh, uh, at the time the, the biggest really good telescope in the world. Now, I don't know if this will come out. Sometimes it all goes a bit haywire with the voice, um, but uh, this is Messier 3. And these are, if you look carefully, you can start seeing blinking stars. Um, and these are some of the variable stars within a, a fairly typical globular star cluster. Most of the ones you can see are the so-called cluster variables, the RR Lyrae stars. Um, but he was looking for Cepheids, which are obviously considerably uh, more luminous. Um, like I said before, he generated 40 papers in, in just five years and uh, started using a variety of methods to uh, try and work out the distances to the globular star clusters and their uh, spatial um, positioning around the galaxy. And uh, he basically worked out that the sun's position was not central. It was uh, offset from the center of the galaxy, which is uh, an important finding. Now, th this, this uh, just throw the couple of other pictures in here. This was taken by uh, uh, Professor van der Bey with a relatively small telescope. This is Messier 5. And uh, again, you can start seeing the, uh, some of the variables within this globular star cluster, which is nicely positioned at the moment, um, uh, to blinking away merrily. So there are plenty of variables to, to look at. And this is an a image taken last year um, showing V42 is the main CFID variable in Messier 5. And um, V84 uh, is a, a form of CFID called R. This is a uh, an RV Tauri star is a different type of uh, pulsating star. Um, so these are, are quite easily observed by amateurs in some respects. Uh, this is a picture I took about a week ago now um, of Messier 5, slightly overexposed, but I thought in light of the Winchester weekends uh, challenged by um, uh, Paul Abel and, and, and Pete Lawrence of um, estimating the distance of, uh, of the delta Cepheid, the, the prototype uh, Cepheid variable. Um, I thought you might like to try it with um, V42. Uh, just follow that through its cycle and just uh, see if you can work out its, uh, its period and therefore its luminosity and therefore the distance to this cluster. I do like to set the odd challenge. Anyway, he basically, uh, Shapley worked out that the sun, as you can perhaps see here, the yellow, the yellow dot, um, was quite at a distance and uh, all the other globulars um, swarmed around the center of the galaxy at varying distances. Now, Curtis, um, very different sort of chap. He had he, been at uh, Lick Observatory from the very early part of the 20th century and also had a, an unusual, um, background. He was a classic Scots scholar. Um, he also taught maths and astronomy. Um, so he was obviously pretty good at, at the teaching side and the presentation side. But um, the astronomy eventually got him and he went to Lick Observatory and became a very established and respected astronomer there. Initially, he continued the work of James Keeler, who died relatively young. He had been uh, surveying the, the spiral nebulae. Um, and uh, started phot photographing them. Um, he uh, used the Crossley mainly, this is his main working instrument, the Crossley ref ref reflector. Um, the mirror itself had been a, a Calver mirror um, and had been Andrew Ainsley Commons' um, old telescope in Ealing, but it had gone to uh, the industrialist uh, Crossley in, um, I think, Halifax or somewhere in Yorkshire, uh, but it not really got used and it was sent over to Lick. Um, and it was used visually uh, initially and then photographically, uh, both the planetary nebulae and uh, also the spiral nebulae. Um, his classification of, of, of the planetary nebulae was based on the morphology of the, uh, 
of, of the planetary nebulae. Um, he was the first person to actually observe the, the jet from the giant elliptical in the center of the Virgo cluster, Messier 87, the one that uh, recently had the imaging of the, the, the black hole or the silhouette. Um, and like myself, he was a keen eclipse chaser. He was a very different personality to, to Shapley. He was a um, well-spoken, gentle, very kind man. Uh, I don't think um, Shapley was as kind. He was definitely Marmite. Um, but I think everybody ra really rather loved Akiva Curtis. The other third person briefly to mention was Adrian van Marnen. He was um, a, a Dutch astronomer, but uh, he came over to the States and volunteered at Yerkes but he got a position at Mount Wilson. And he was um, particularly good at measuring uh, stars within our own galaxy. Um, his star, Van Marmen's star, was the first isolated white dwarf to be found. He was a year older than, um, than Shapley, but they became very close friends and I think probably influenced one another. Um, he was starting to, to look at the spiral nebulae, but he felt these were in the uh, Milky Way galaxy. And um, he was pretty convinced for many years, he was convinced that he could measure rotation of individual stars in the spiral nebulae. Now, he certainly couldn't. Uh, he was using a blink comparator um, and uh, um, really on some old plates. Now, this is a sort of typical plate of the time, if you like. He was using some of George Rich's old plates from up to 20 years before as well as comparisons. And um, probably they weren't up to scratch. Uh, scratch being probably the operative word. Um, he did, however, uh, put sort of what he thought were the star motions. Now, th these arrows do not represent the 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 amount of movement of an individual star. They just show the direction and magnitude that he thought he'd done. But um, really and truly, he was in error. So we come to the debate. Eventually, yeah, I'll think oh, ten minutes. Should be all right. Um, <clears throat> the scale of the universe happened. It started at 8.15 of the evening. And because they wanted their wine and nibbles, I think it was, uh, they were truncated to 35 minutes each, each speaker. And they only had a very short time for questions afterwards. So the um, conversazione began at 9.30. Um, and sadly, the, uh, um, the, the questions weren't, weren't recorded. Um, Shapley's talk was a fairly elementary one, surprisingly elementary. We think it was probably because he didn't want to make um, uh, any too many controversial statements. He didn't want the um, Eastern, Euro Eastern uh, American uh, astronomers um, to get the wrong idea about him. Um, he also didn't present it desperately well. He, he, he read his script. Um, this still exists, um, 19 pages of, of typescript. Um, six of the first 16 defined the light year, which was probably a little bit too basic for a talk of this kind. Um, the last three described how his, he developed an intensifier uh, to photograph the faint stars in globular star clusters, which was probably also um, probably unnecessary. And he hardly mentioned the distances to the spiral nebulae just touched on it at the end of his of, of his presentation. Um, and uh, I'll come to the paper that would be produced later because that uh, uh, his, his actual talk at this debate uh, was quite different. Um, Curtis much stuck to, his, stuck to his guns. Um, unfortunately, his script doesn't exist, but some of his uh, illustrations do. Um, it was a much more professional job. He, he presented it clearly, it was more technical, um, and uh, he delivered it with fairly scant notes. So they gave their talks. There was um, no real consensus regarding it as a contest. No, there was no firm winner, no firm loser. Um, some people, Commentators later would say that Curtis might have edged it, but a, but a draw. If you're going to look at it as a uh, as a sport, if you like, um, but they both made points which were both right and wrong. 
Um, and uh, this probably, if it had just left been left at that, we would never have had the great debate as it became known later, quite a bit later. Um, the contest itself uh, was acknowledged by both speakers. The uh, Curtis um, thought he, he, he went, did it pretty well. He said, the debate went off, fine. I've been assured that I came out considerably in front. Well, that might be a little bit of bravado. Um, and Shapley later, much later in life, confessed, I, I would have known how to dodge things a little better. Curtis was an articulate person, which he clearly was, and was not scared, i.e. had nothing to lose, like the directorship of the Harvard, um, uh, Harvard position. So after the debate meeting, though, we had what would become a very important couple of papers um, in the Bulletin of the National Research Council. This was published in, in May of uh, 1921 where both Shapley and then Curtis um, elaborated on their theories. Um, in, and both of these papers were very much more uh, professional, if you like. Shapley went first again. Um, he, he, his, he was in part one of the uh, paper, Evolution of the Ideas of Galactic Size, Surveying the Solar Neighborhood, On the Distances of Globular Clusters, and the Dimensions and Arrangement of the Galactic System. Um, so that was really, he, he started laying out in a much more professional way um, his arguments. Um, that was followed by Curtis, he, he, his dimensions and structure of the galaxy, evidence furnished by the magnitude of the stars, and the spirals as external galaxies. Now, <clears throat> the conclusions from these papers um, uh, really uh, generated a whole lot more commentary. And um, later commentators sifted out 14 points, um, well, certainly um, Virginia Trimble did, um, from the papers which Shapley and Curtis disagreed. And these really just in, in, in essence is what it boils down to. Is Shapley certainly correct regarding the sun being well off the center of the galaxy, which this is well established now. Um, he was correct that the galaxy was much larger than previously thought, i.e. much bigger than the captains, but not as big as uh, he thought. Um, and he was right to use Cepheid variables as distance indicators. Um, <clears throat> he was, however, wrong about the spiral galaxies. They were external to the Milky Way galaxy. Um, he overestimated the size of the galaxy and both of them, in fact, were wrong regarding the impact of the absorption of light by the interstellar medium. This was something that uh, many astronomers would work on in, in the following um, two decades, people like Trumpler uh, and so forth, and uh, Walter Bader. Um, Curtis was correct in so much as the spiral nebulae, as we now know, are external galaxies. He was correct about Van Manen's measurements being inaccurate, in fact, uh, completely wrong. But he, he was wrong about the Cepheids as reliable standard because he never really trusted them. I don't really know why he didn't trust them. He was wrong about the sun's place in the galaxy. He still had the sun as the center. He underestimated the size of the galaxy. And um, as I say, was wrong regarding the absorption of light by the interstellar medium, which, which made for all sorts of inaccuracies at the time, uh, which have slowly been short, surely been sorted out. So what did they do later? Well, Shapley did get a position at uh, Harvard almost immediately after this debate, um, but he didn't become director initially, he was just the professor of astronomy. Um, but the following year, he did become director and indeed had a, an, a, over 30 years at Harvard. And he was a very good astronomer, continued to uh, do active astronomy and, and, uh, and was a great administrator. Um, Curtis uh, well, went on to, same year, at the same 1920, um, to Allegheny Observatory. It's a rather beautiful observatory uh, in Pittsburgh, um, Pennsylvania, uh, where he stayed for 10 years. Um, but he didn't really ever get going again with the observational astronomy. He tinkered with the instrumentation and, uh, and, and administration. So his, his research career almost ground to a halt. So what happened? Well, of course, 
the great debate itself was actually a, a running debate for for a couple of decades um it the the meeting um was perhaps the focal point for it but not until the 1930s early 1930s did anybody come to the firm conclusion uh, about the nature of the galaxies although they really should have done because edwin hubble came in in 1923 um got himself onto the 100 inch hooker telescope which had been uh, present from 19 um yeah 1917 and um he found a seafid in messier 31 and uh, this um, was the first of several CFID discoveries in the galaxy and indeed Messier 33. This was the 100 inch Hooker telescope and looks very old fashioned now, but it's actually a fantastic telescope. It really was uh, uh, very historic and it's still going. I, I visited it uh, um, in 2000 and it was just wonderful to see it. Um, this is a, a very famous picture that many of you will have seen before of uh, where he thought he found a nova but he found the CFID, uh, 6th of October 1923. Now he started measuring the distances to these two galaxies. Um, he underestimated them of course but there were a lot of other factors to, to that. He, he thought uh, the Andromeda galaxy to be 900,000 light years away but clearly well outside uh, the Milky Way galaxy. So um, great debate. Well it wasn't truly a debate in, in the sense that they weren't fighting a corner in a, in a way, but it became a watershed for our understanding of, of the way the universe is structured. Um, obviously, things developed later. Um, the paper that followed um, in 100 years ago next month um, did go quite some way to resolving the controversy, I, I think, because... Uh, this triggered the interest of Edwin Hubble et al. Um, neither of these two astronomers really won. Um, I think they were both correct on important points which you have uh, taken on into the next, uh, uh, for the next hundred years. Uh, I think we would say that both were great astronomers, very different men, um, but uh, nevertheless, um, very, very uh, important people in the development of our understanding of the universe. Um, it did, however, take the much better known, perhaps, Edwin Hubble, um, partly because of the Space Telescope, but uh, generally speaking, um, to nail the distant scale of the universe. But uh, I would have to say, haven't we come a long way in 100 years? Gosh, OG, thank you all very much. Thank you, Nick. That was that was really good. Um, a really good run through and an interesting cast of characters, um, as you often get in these astronomical debates and controversies. So um, we've got a bit of time for questions now. So if you've got any questions to ask, you can ask them through the Q&A on Zoom okay. or through the uh, comments on YouTube. Um, we've got a few questions, so I'll, I'll start running through them. So one from Daryl Dobbs. Um, asking about the, the jet in M87, and he asked, did Curtis observe that visually or photographically? And at the time he observed it, did he have any idea what it was? Um, he certainly didn't know what it was. There's not an awful lot written about it, but it was a visual observation uh, with the Crossley. And um, I, I, I think there were a lot of possible interpretations of that at the time. It could have almost, at the time been a you know another little galaxy superimposed or whatever they certainly had no idea of of jets coming out of galaxies uh, uh, in that era um obviously quite a bit later when when the instrumentation and the imaging uh, took over it would become clear that it was linked directly to messier 87. The Crossley is a really interesting telescope isn't it historically yeah. I mean the fact that this telescope that started its life in, in rainy Yorkshire should end up on Mount Hamilton in California. But yeah. um, I don't think there's much of the original telescope left. It's like kind of replacing bits of a broom, isn't it? They've kind yeah. of replaced it. In fact, it in fact is now essentially in a broom cupboard because um, I, I did visit uh, and it was in pretty much in bits. Um, yeah, I think it's mainly the mirror that's uh, part of the Crossley now. I think they probably put it into a new mounting. Um, but the, the mirror being a calver is, is still 
should really the Americans should sort themselves out and get mm. get that into a historic context because it was a it was a, a very good telescope. Of course, it's the one that um, Common took his picture of the Iran Nebula back in the eighteen uh, eighties, I think, or yeah. eighteen ninety. Um, so so it's got some uh, some pretty good pedigree. Um, but yes, it, uh, it it really needs um, not putting in the vault of a museum, but it, get it back up and running and get the public to use it. Mm. Well, any, anyone who's been to Mount Hamilton knows what a wonderful place it is. And it, it's a shame that that telescope, you can't even go in the dome, I think, at the moment, because yeah. uh, because it's it's basically not maintained. Yeah. Um, a question from Stuart, Stuart Moore, um, who says, excellent talk, Nick. Why do you think uh, Besto Slifer has not received the publicity he deserved? Yeah, he, he kept going for a very long time at Lowell. He, he had a long career there. Um, he was a relatively young man when he um, did these observations. And uh, you think he was in, in his 90s when he, when he died. Um, whether it was because it was uh, a relatively small observatory, but uh, I, th I think he's coming out much more now into the... Into the um, Hall of Fame, um, but yeah, it's difficult to know. His his, his brother, um, I think, uh, was a Mars observer, um, and maybe he, he perhaps would got more publicity at that time. Earl Slifer, um, but uh, I'm not sure. He he certainly uh, need, needs to get uh, more recognition, perhaps. Yeah, I can see. Yeah, Peter. yeah. Peter Jellick saying um, he'd like to ask whether anyone around that time, 1920s, would have had the side view of the Milky Way that we take so much for granted today. Um, the earliest he's found was by Plaskett, and in, another interesting character, in um, 1936. Yeah, I, I, I don't know the answer to that, really. Um, is it, they certainly were aware that, uh, that lots of the spiral nebulae had dust lanes across them. And in fact, they, they thought that the dust was all in a ring around the galaxies um, rather than inter, inter, intermingled with the stars of the galaxy. And they felt that the Milky Way, so one of the arguments for the Milky Way being um, a, a galaxy like, like the external galaxies, uh, but I, 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 they must have um, had, a, had a feel for the uh, shape of the galaxy because uh, Captain had decided it was, um, uh, you know, a, a lens-shaped galaxy. But whether they would have had the the side view, I I, I can't be sure. Mm. Um, Plaskett in 1936. Yeah, I I need to read about him. I don't know an awful lot about that uh, observation. But it, everything was a lot smaller then, wasn't it? Even even people who thought that the galaxies were were actually outside ours, the distances were still much much smaller than what we know now. Indeed, um, yes. And you know the whole distance scale. And what what's really interesting is that it was only two or three years later that Hubble really got going on this. So do you think you know either of the protagonists in this debate knew how quickly it was going to be resolved? Could they see the kind of writing on the wall that it was going to go one way or the other? I think Curtis was confident that he, he was going to get, you know, I think most of the astronomers even before this great debate thought that the spiral nebulae were outside external. And um, three years later, of course, Hubble pretty much nailed it. The, just the, there were sort of doubts. People like Van Manen was very persuasive about his measurements, despite the fact that lots and lots of other people looked at his measurements and uh, disagreed with them. Um, so he, he sort of stuck to his guns and because I think he was fairly respected in, in his uh, measures of, of our own Milky Way galaxy measures, um, people was still in some doubt, but it was about 1930, 1931, I think, that uh, that, that became clear that it, it did drag on for longer than it should, I think, is it fair to say, yeah. Yeah, uh, well, that often happens in science, doesn't it? it yes. In the face yes. of incontrovertible evidence, people <laughs> yeah. still hold a view. Um, just a couple of comments from people who say thank you. So uh, Anna Wheeler says, thank you, Nick. Very enjoyable talk. Yeah. Um, Stuart says, uh, thanks, Nick, as well. And Stuart actually has a question um, which is what was what was the effect of the interstellar and intergalactic medium on their conclusions? I, I guess. Well, they didn't really take it into neither of these two chaps took it into account. Um, I think they 
a lot of a lot of the evidence for it came from Barnard's um, photographic work with the Bruce telescope, Bruce camera, um, about the amount of material within the galaxy. Um, but that was really only starting to emerge just in a few years prior to the Great Debate, and I think they essentially ignored it. Um, and I think it's a lot of that was to do from the from um, Curtis's point of view. Um, he 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 didn't really trust the the CFID variable measures for one reason or another. Um, whether that was anything to do with the interstellar medium, I, I'm not sure. Um, certainly, uh, Shapley didn't take it into account at all. Um, and of course, some of the globular clusters are really quite seriously interfered with by the interstellar medium. Um, other, others much less so. Things like the intergalactic tramp miles out up in Lynx is, uh, is, is, is very um, unen unencumbered with the interstellar medium. But um, yeah, basically interstellar medium made all the, the distances much shorter. Uh, they, they've really, uh, yeah. So uh, another to explain messy. Uh, hmm. Yeah. So so Martin, Martin Berger, Berger did, did they try and explain M thirty two? So I guess that's in connection with satellite galaxies. And... Yes, they they didn't. No, they. I mean, Slyford had measured and it got a, got the same um, blue shift with Messier thirty two. But um, I I don't think either of the two protagonists in the debate really tackled that specifically. No, I think they there were so many other. Uh, fuzzy blobs to look at. I think that probably was just uh, a relatively insignificant fuzzy blob at the time. Yeah. Yeah. And and often is the way you can ignore evidence if it doesn't support the things you, like. you want. Um, Ken Kennedy, just to comment saying, thanks, Nick, an excellent talk on a fascinating historic subject. Thank you, and Ken. Jack, Jack Martin as well says, uh, very interesting. Thanks for your efforts. Um, just a question from a couple of questions from me then, because we haven't got any others, but if to give These are the, the tricky group. ones you were threatening me with. No, them. not really. So yeah. the, the rotation of M101 was what, one of the pieces of evidence, I think, that was put forward, wasn't it? That it yes, was indeed. much closer. So do we know why that was so much in error? Was was that just kind of wishful thinking on behalf of um, the observer there? Yeah, Van, Van Manen basically was, he was comparing recent plates with much older plates well by much older I'm talking maybe five ten years where the plates were not so good and there would be optical defects within the slight you know very small defects within the plates but uh, enough to to skew the measures the actual measures of a star um, in another galaxy would were, were really difficult um, I mean in fact impossible uh, at that time, they they but he he felt he could just detect these these mi micro uh, movements of the of of the individual stars. Um, yeah, I think probably bless him set it set things back by by a decade probably just by sticking to his guns there. Yeah. Um, but I think it was partly the the optical telescopes who basically using um, initially was using the. Uh, the, the Riches telescope, which we developed, the Ritchie Kretchen the, the type of system, and um, they're fantastic telescopes now, of course. But uh, perhaps in those days, there were little, little slight errors that crept in, and measuring plates and things like that were were difficult to use. Great big cumbersome things. You probably seen old measuring plates, and these were relatively recent ones. The ones from the beginning of that century were. Um, much more difficult to use. So I think a variety of, of errors occurred, um, unfortunately. And um, it rather smeared Van Man's reputation in latter years, so we'll have to stick to his white dwarf as his main legacy. <laughs> okay, and uh, I don't think we've had any more questions, so just one final comment from me. If we were going to have a great debate, if we were going to invite some people to, to a meeting today to have a great debate on a topic of astronomical importance, um, what do you think it would be? Uh, yeah, I think it would have to be dark matter. Um, though, though there would probably not be any conclusions about that at the end of the debate. But I, I would have thought that would be the, the one that would probably be the most likely to cause, uh, uh, be, be, to function for a debate, be a good debate, it'd be a lively debate, but nobody knows. <laughs>
You're sure it wouldn't be in the, the same category as the relativity debate? Only about three people in the room would actually get to understand. <laughs> yes, it could, it, it could well be, yes. I suppose one for the RAS, not the BAA. Yeah. Okay, th thank you very much, Nick, for that, um, for um, giving us a really good insight into um, the 101st anniversary, I guess, of the great, yeah. great debate, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, so the, the next uh, BAA webinar is actually our, our one day spring webinar, which is uh, replacing the Nottingham meeting that was planned for Saturday, April the 24th. Um, so we've got um, two good talks on, on that one. Um, that'll be on um, Zoom and YouTube like this. And I think I'm down to, uh, to do the IT on that. So anything that goes wrong on that uh, is going to be down to me. Um, and then through the summer, the webinars are continuing uh, at a reduced frequency, but we've got a really good range of different uh, speakers and different topics to cover. So thank you for joining us tonight. Um, anyone who missed it who, or indeed who wants to watch it again, um, it'll be on Zoom shortly, uh, on YouTube shortly, so you can watch that. So thanks very much. And thank you, Nick. And good night, everybody.